Good evening, everybody. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, the weather made it especially interesting. Uh, uh, pouring rain some places, not in others. So I, I thank you for bearing uh, the weather and, and coming here tonight. Um, I talk a lot usually, but, but I'm speechless right now. Uh, it's very hard to process what we've been, what we have been through, uh, as, as a, as a people, as a culture, as a, as a world and humankind. Uh, it, it only underscores how much more I think, uh, our mission is important to the world. And I, I want to thank the staff of the museum for uh, all the work that they're doing to keep their wits about themselves as we continue on with our with our work and uh, law enforcement uh, giving us regular protection. Uh, Chief Tony Holloway, who uh, who came by, we heard just heard from the mayor uh, and the city council just passed. Uh, a resolution in support of the state of Israel uh, that it has some teeth to it. It's it's uh, not merely ceremonial, uh, and uh, it'll be covered in the media. Um, uh, and we're we're doing our part. Um, the connection between recent events and the subject of this program are or will become obvious, but first. Uh, I'm Carl Goodman, by the way. I'm the CEO of the museum. I want to make sure you have a chance to view uh, the two works we have on loan uh, from the artist, uh, Felix Lombersky. They're uh, no, no less powerful than they've always been, and it's really a, a, a great privilege to be able to show the work here. Uh, and I invite you also to read about the work uh, and, and also your handout. Um, what I want to do is first thank people who've made this evening possible, uh, Debbie and Brett Sembler, uh, for their support of the event and this uh, Florida Holocaust Museum lecture uh, done in collaboration with the University of South Florida, St. Pete, just down the street. Uh, we want to thank our partners in this initiative, the USF Institute for Russian, European, and Eurasian Studies. Um, the presenter of this lecture, Elena Limbersky, she grew up in Leningrad and immigrated to the U.S. in 1987. Um, she is the author of two nonfiction works, Felix Limbersky Paintings and Drawings in 2009, and what we have over at the table there, like a drop of ink in a downpour, which uh, she co-authored with her mother, Galina. Um, the memoir, uh, which you're going to learn more about, uh, was a 2022 finalist in the National Jewish Book Awards and the Indie Book of the Year. The book was also a selection for Great Group Reads, and it is a great group read, uh, by the Women's National Book Association. Uh, she's also been a guest on National Public Radio and Radio Boston and the BBC, so it's 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 especially uh, uh, wonderful to have her here with us. Um, this is uh, even more impressive. She uh, holds, and I'm terribly sorry to be laying it on thick here, but it's very impressive. She holds degrees in art and architecture from MIT and the University of Michigan. She is, of course, the granddaughter of Felix Limbersky, the author of these works, who lived from 1913 to 1970. Um, his roots are in Poland and Ukraine. Uh, his Babinyar, and that's how we are pronouncing it, Babinyar, for a number of reasons, paintings um, exhibited here. They comprise the earliest artistic representation of this 
horrific massacre in Kyiv during the Nazi occupation of Ukraine. Um, the work was originally banned uh, from exhibits in the Soviet Union, and then they became widely known and exhibited in the US and in London, England. Uh, they appeared in numerous international publications in the US, Germany, and Israel, including the Times of Israel, the Jerusalem Report, Tablet, the Forward, and the websites of National Public Radio. Uh, so it is with great pleasure that we introduce the author, scholar, and granddaughter of Felix Limbersky, Elena Limbersky. Thank you, Carl. Um, I want to join Carl and thank uh, everyone who made this um, exhibition and this event possible. I want to thank Iris and the Florida Holocaust Museum. And I want to specifically, especially thank the donors um, of this museum and of this uh, lecture series. I want to thank the team, the staff of this museum, uh, Erin Blackenship, Miranda Brenner, uh, Clay, uh, Clayton Richards. Um, I want to very much thank Amy Alvarez for designing these beautiful posters that I just was stunned to see this, uh, this evening. And when you have the time, please take a look at the text and then excerpts from the um, from from Vasily Grossman that give the context for these paintings. Um, everyone worked incredibly, incredibly hard to bring this exhibition and to bring this event together. And I just, I'm just humbled by everyone's time. So I just want to give another applause to the team. So I, um, so you have Carl gave you a little bit of the context for these paintings. They are the earliest. Uh, um, of the bio, uh, representation of Bobby R. And my grandfather's entire lifetime, for despite many, many, many attempts of trying to exhibit them in the Soviet Union, in Russia, he was never allowed to put them on display. Many of his drawings were exhibited, his earlier realist works were exhibited, but these paintings were always taken out of the exhibitions. If I had my chance to speak with him right now, um, and he will be 110 years old, somewhere, maybe nearby. Um, if I had a chance to, I want to ask him, I want to ask him, how do you feel? How, could you have imagined living there in the 60s, in the 70s, where you could not speak about uh, Holocaust? How do you feel that now these paintings are here? They're saved, they are shown around the world. So how many of you are from Eastern, have roots in Eastern Europe? Where? Poland. Czech, Czech, Ukraine. Where in Ukraine? Galicia. Oh, Galicia. Yeah. You? Poland. Poland. We also live in Hof. It's now it's Lviv. Lviv, which used to be Lemberg, right? Which is where my last name is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my. Um, I'll talk about this later, but yeah. Um, the Holocaust did not end in 1945. It continued for those who lived through the Shoah, for those who lost their loved ones. It continued in the second and the third generation. We now read books from the generations after, the ones who remember. We now know about the epigenetics of uh, transgenerational trauma. We carry this trauma in our bodies in the second, in the third generations. My children uh, who never been to Russia, who have never experienced uh, a war, thank God, uh, they still have this trauma in their bodies. And in the Soviet Union, the Holocaust never ended because it, there was never a closure. After the war, in 1945, Stalin banned the discussion of Holocaust. This was the first Holocaust denier, I guess, in the history of Holocaust denying. He banned 
the discussion of Holocaust. Here we were, a million people, million Soviet Jews were missing, empty apartments, empty land. And um, their families were never told what had happened. They were, their murder was never made public. Their families, have, uh, after the end of the war, my grandfather um, looked for his parents. He wrote to agencies for displaced persons. He wrote to the Red Cross. Uh, and the response was always the same. They're missing. Location unknown. Uh, no further information. This was his white Holocaust. A blank page, a blank canvas. It was the blankness, the void that he had to fill in with his imagination. And when he couldn't find his pain parents, he started to retrace um, their steps on canvas. In 1948 uh, and 49, coinciding with the foundation, with for establishment of Israel, Stalin unleashed a new anti-Semitic campaign. During that time, uh, all the Jewish schools that were remaining still, uh, Jewish theaters, publishing houses were shut down. Thousands of Jews were accused of political crimes, sent to Gulag and executed. Growing up in the 70s and 80s um, in Leningrad, I have never heard uh, any reference to, to Jewish history, heritage in my schools. Here we were, there were scores of Jews, and as I'm finding out now that many of my classmates had Jewish heritage, but we could never knew, talk about this, and it was never discussed in public. Jewish books were banned from the libraries, there were no Hebrew schools. I never heard the word Holocaust or Shoah in my childhood. This word did not exist in the Russian vocabulary. Hundreds of Jewish mass graves remained unmarked. Sometimes fragments of bones and little leather boots of a child would surface on the surface at the earth when the wind would blow the topsoil. And in the 1950s, the young people, the generation of my mother, began to gather at these sites, at these unmarked graves, to clean them up in Rumbly, in uh, near Riga, in Latvia, at Babi Yar, at other sites, they would gather, they would put um, plywood markers. Authorities would take uh, those markers down and the youth would return and put those markers back. In Leningrad, where I grew up, uh, students began to gather secretly in um, private apartments to study Hebrew to learn Jewish rituals, to, learn, to read religious texts. It was very dangerous. Uh, the police followed them. People who taught these classes were blacklisted, expelled from the universities. Uh, you know, you have heard the stories over your lifetime. Uh, my mother went to some of these uh, meetings. Um, it took a great courage to take that risk, uh, not only for herself, but also for me, for my grandmother. Um, but I'm grateful that she did. The very first page of Hebrew letters that uh, I saw in my life um, was the page that she brought from one of those gatherings. She brought it and gave it to me and said, um, she said, learn, learn it. This is a sacred language. And I did, and I taught it to my children. Um, and in my home, um, we grow, I lived in a small apartment, three-bedroom apartment, two-bedroom apartment. Uh, the living room was also a bedroom. Um, I had 500 paintings by my grandfather. So I would see his work in the museums and the public places. Some of his paintings were exhibited at, uh, if anyone went to Leningrad, at the young pal to Palace of Young Pioneers. Uh, in the main lobby, so every child would went and see those paintings, uh, would, would, would go buy those paintings by my grandfather. But it, the paint, many of the works in my house uh, could never be exhibited because they did not fit uh, with socialist realism. So guests would come to uh, our home to see these works. 
And on a day when the guests would arrive, I remember my grandmother and I would move our furniture around and we would push the red couch away from the wall. And she would bring these paintings one by one and neatly stack them along the wall. And I remember guests would come in and as a small child, five, six, seven years old, I remember feeling the reverence, the reverence for this art that the guests would bring into the room. They would take off their shoes, they would walk in their socks. And inevitably somebody would ask to see the Babi Yar. And my grandmother would bring it in and everybody would get up and they would look at those paintings in silence. And I couldn't understand it because to be honest, I did not like this painting. It was dark. And I asked my grandmother, Grandma, what, what is Babushka? What is, what is Babi Yar? And I remember she was always very, very cheerful. Everything was a celebration. But when I asked that question, I could see her eyes went wide. And she turned away and she took that painting and she took it back to the closet. She had never spoke uh, to me or to my mother about Holocaust. She never spoke about Holocaust to us, even when she was living in an arbor in the 1990s where she was free to talk about anything. She spoke about the siege, she spoke about uh, standing on the rooftops with a bucket of sand, putting out the fires when the Nazi bombed the, through the Fugaz uh, bombs, but she never spoke about Holocaust. So the fight that the young people in the Soviet Union began to recognize uh, Holocaust um, and to bring back our heritage grew into international movement. This international movement included, I'm sure, many of you, the American Jews and the Israeli Jews. And um, your effort um, and my mother's effort and her generation is the reason that I'm here today and that these paintings are saved and that could be um, here in this museum. Um, okay. Amy? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. Researchers who study uh, wars, genocide, terror, and acts of terrorism work with large, large numbers. One million, six million, 85 million. What does it mean? Our human mind is not capable to comprehend these numbers. And this is good because it is for our protection. It protects us from despair or going mad. But at the same time, we need to keep focus on the human condition of these people and art, literature, life stories that this museum tells um, give us a chance to transfer time and to feel, to relieve another person's experience. And visual art is especially uh, important because it is interpretive. Um, it doesn't spell everything out. It forces us to look and put our own experiences, even if they are very different, into this work of art. And so we become the co-creators of the painting. So I want to show the first work that has nothing to do with Holocaust. Well, not almost nothing. Uh, this is the earliest painting by my grandfather. And I want to ask you to look at it. Uh, it was done several years before the war. Um, this is a man I never met. Um, my mother never met him. We don't have photographs of his. Um, so I want to ask you, what do you see? I see four shadows. Four shadows. <laughs> You're amazing. What do you see in those shadows? Family. Does anyone else see four shadows? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And what is interesting, what is strange about this family, about the shadows? 
other characters. There are slightly different colors. There are layers, layers of uh, ink. And the shadow is facing the wrong direction. Right? Did he not know how to paint? <laughs> this shadow is facing the man as opposed to facing the us where it as a shadow should be. So what does it mean? Are these memories? I think this could be memories. Yeah? Is it leaving a legacy that he carries these people with him? Is it um he is it a Hasidic vision that the past is also a present, that we are always surrounded by the people who have lived before us, their ancestors? Um, these are uh, two drawings of uh, Limberski. This, these are Limberski's mother and his uh, father. Um, they were Polish Jews. Uh, they were uh, they lived in Lublin. She was a pianist, um, and he was mathematician. Um, so they lived in Lublin, where Limberski was Felix was born. And at the beginning of World War One, they became refugees and moved to Berdichev, uh, the town. Does any anybody hear, heard of Berdichev? Yes. Yeah. So it was a very Jewish town. It was known as the uh, Jerusalem of uh, Eastern Europe or Jerusalem of Ukraine. 85% uh, were Jews before World War uh, Two, before World War One. Um, but the war followed them, and very soon Ukraine also became engulfed in the conflict. World War One turned into the revolution into, this is the images of Berdichev, into civil war, followed by a famine. Uh, there was eight years of compounded suffering in which Jewish uh, civilians suffered the greatest from all sides. It was a colossal civilian loss. Uh, I think the uh, population uh, lost half of, uh, reduced, to, reduced in half. Uh, Limberski's uh, mother was, um, Limberski's mother became a um, caregiver at the orphanage, then she became a teacher at the public schools. And in the, um, let me see, okay, let me go back for a second. Um, she became, yes, and um, so the 1920s became a uh, safe, peaceful time in Ukraine. And it was the time where there was a blossoming of creative um, Cre creativity among the artists. And I will talk about this uh, a little bit later. I just want to plan this. But art was extremely important because 95% of Russia were people were illiterate. And so art was a way to t deliver messages, to tell the stories, to, to educate. Um, and Limberski, my grandfather Felix, became, became interested. He was talented. And he uh, moved to Kiev to study art. He studied at the Jewish Kulturliga, at the art, um, Kiev Art Institute. And then he moved to Leningrad to study um, at the Academy of Art. He was still a student um, in uh, 1941. Uh, in June of 41, he came back to visit his parents. Uh, Nazi attacked on June 22nd and quickly advanced into Ukraine. He uh, received orders to return to Leningrad and join the defense of the city. And he had one train ticket out of Berdichev. His mother and his father walked him to the train station. She said, take care of yourself. Please remember to wear your woolen scarf because it is cold in Leningrad. She said, don't worry about us. Who would bother with old people? On September 15, we marked the 82nd anniversary of Berdichev massacre. Um, 20 uh, to 30,000 Jews were murdered there over the course of three days. Um, the massacre served as a model for the Nazis for by firing, uh, murder by firing squads elsewhere in the occupation. And two weeks later, um, 
want to leave this quote for a minute. And two weeks later, on September 29 and 30, uh, the Nazi murdered 33,000 Jews of Kiev at Babi Yar. Babi Yar became the largest two-day massacre of Soviet Jews, and it became synonymous with Holocaust in the Soviet Union, just as Auschwitz is known as is a symbol of uh, death camps in the West. It is uh, Babi Yar that is known as the Holocaust by bullet. So I want to show, I want us to look at these paintings and I want to read a story by uh, Vasily Grossman. Um, and maybe many of you know Vasily Grossman. He was a war correspondent and he was among the first people who entered Ukraine after the Nazis were driven out. He was, uh, he prepared the black book that will, could never be published in Russia uh, and Life and Fate and many other novels. Uh, but I want to read a short story called The Old Teacher uh, while we look at the paintings. When the column of Jews crossed the railway and leaving the highway headed off towards the voices, uh, I'm sorry, let me start over. Actually, let me start, sorry. When the column of Jews crossed the railway and leaving the highway who headed off towards the ravine, Haim Kulish took a lungful of air and above the hubbub of hundreds of voices shouted in Yiddish, Oi friends, I had my day. Landing a punch on a temple of the soldier walking beside him, he knocked him down and snatched his submachine gun out of his hands. He took a swing with his heavy gun and smashed it into the face of an under officer who had come running up from one side. In the commotion that followed, little Katya Weissman lost her mother and her grandmother. She was clutching the hem of the old Rosenthal's uh, jacket. With some difficulty, he picked her up. He turned his head towards her ear and said, don't cry, Katya, don't cry. Holding onto his neck with one head, the girl answered, I'm not crying, teacher. People were backing away from the ravine. Some were refusing to move forward. Some were falling to the ground. Soon, Rosenthal was close to the front of the crowd. His breathing became labored, but the old man kept holding the little girl in his arms. How can I comfort her? How can I deceive her? The old man wondered, gripped by a feeling of infinite sorrow. The little girl turned toward him. Her voice was calm. It was the pale face of an adult, a face full of tolerant compassion. And in a sudden silence, he heard her voice. Teacher, she said, don't look that way. It will frighten you. And like a mother, she covered his eyes with the palm of her hand. So can I ask you to describe what you see? darkness. That's what I saw. That's very interesting. Huh? That's a very interesting point that it's The crossing of the Red Sea, the the, the biblical, the bi there is a sense of biblical biblical uh, times in the way that uh, these figures are presented. Um, yes, I'm sorry. And, and to enter the ravine, that's, 
That's, this is, this is, you're absolutely right. This is the edge of the ravine. This, this, um, this painting looks quite close to, quite, quite close to the way the Kiev ravine was, uh, looks like. Uh, Limberski lived in Kiev, so he knew these places and he knew many people who died, perished in the Babi Yar. So at the edge of the ravine, right there, right, you can see people that are being led and there is a Nazi with, with a dog. Um, yes. The mood is, is very dark. He intentionally chose darker colors to portray the, the sadness or the epicness of what was happening at the time. So we have to study it carefully in order to, to see the elements that he wants us to see. It's very, very, it's vague, right? He doesn't make these uh, figures very explicit they're almost kind of sunk into this fog into the dark fog and it's very interesting i want to know why he didn't paint specific faces and i think one possibility is because as grossman writes one name one person if there were millions and others that were lost i think he wanted these people to be vague um, obscured because they were obscured right from from us Evolution means that people have to go through these stages to one day be enlightened. It's that is also the suggestion there. That from the dark there will be light, right? From the yes. Sorry. Right there, are you, are you thinking? You know, it's very interesting because yesterday another student said the very same thing and I always saw this painting as dark. But I will show you the last painting and there is a clear device where there is a smoke on one side and a clearing in the sky. And I think you're right, right spot on that it is about darkness. That's right. Yes, so on the right, on, on the right, right here, this is a gas van, right? This is a gas van. And if you notice, there is, uh, there is something that looks like a letter F. I don't think it's accidental, and it's also a red cross. And uh, I think some of you know that when the Nazis brought in the gas to the death camps, to Auschwitz, they, mass uh, they camouflaged it with the, with the red cross. Uh, signature. So I think that, so historically, the uh, Babi Yard did not have the gas vans, the killing machines for the infirm. They were brought in a little bit later in Min, uh, in Belarus, but but he does bring this in, um, and there are Nazis in front of it. So let me show. I have some details um, uh, from the close-ups. Um, so these is these these are the shadows. Of course, the paintings are right behind us. It's just stunning to see them large. Right, and these these elements will reappear in his later work, uh, if we have time to look at it. Uh, so this is this is somebody who is wounded or perhaps a person who died. Uh, but what is uh, I think important for Limberski is that he, even though these people were unarmed, he st they are still showing their protest. Right, there is always a raised fist, and there is a child that leans over uh, this dying person. Um, sorry, am I rushing? Uh, this is, I'm sorry for the resolution. These are the, the same detail from the, his last painting. Um, so there are three, three paintings. This is a close up of the Nazis guarding the gas van, right? Somebody is closing the eyes, reading Shemayn, and there is a fist again from the background. And I want um, to point out this shovel Right in all of these paintings, there is always shovel somewhere, and it becomes this recurrent, prominent symbol in this Babi Yard. Can I, I, I want to ask. Should I go back? In all the darkness, the dark colors, 
-hmm. In the center, there is that bright yellow wrapped around what to me looks like a child. Almost, those children is always, that's always the hope and the future. So that's what I see. That's you're very, very observant because I think colors are not accidental for, uh, for him. The yellow, right? And the blue. There is always a yellow and the blue. So. And that's also Ukrainian flag colors. Oh my gosh, I never thought of this. <laughs> I always think of yellow as a as a as a as the yellow star, right? And the blue is the blue star. But it's also sun. It's also positive. Yes. So so here is the thing about the paintings. Um, so the last, so the last painting is marked as 1952. The first one, the other two are unmarked. There is a very clear progression in uh, Limbersky's style and color, and these paintings are very similar in technique to his thesis paintings that he created in 19 late 30s, uh, 41. Uh, even even some of the figures, even some of these elements are kind of transferred from his thesis painting to these ones. So, but I don't want to be wrong, and that's why I give this broad range. I think they could have, he could have started painting them in 43. Uh, this painting is the first one, and it is large, as large as those works, but it was done on, in oil on two sheets of paper glued together, because during the war there were no canvas available to him. But this is the first sketch. Um, for the painting and you see this person perhaps collaborator because he is smoking a cigarette a little privilege that may have been available to him and he is showering the graves and the last one now oh, see i walked away from my notes the last one the last one was created in 1952. Uh, and for those of you, I'm sure you know Soviet history, this was, right, this was the year of the most vicious anti-Semitic campaign. This was the year when Stalin murdered Yiddish uh, writers, the people who were members of anti-fascist so anti committee, the people who came to America during the war, who worked with Einstein and other people to raise funds for the effort, for the war effort. All of them were um, executed in 1954. There was a street, anti-Semitic violence in the street. My grandmother would have, on the bus, somebody would yell to her, you know, go back to Israel. And so she would cover her face with a scarf um, to avoid these attacks. So it took tremendous courage for Limbersky to complete, to work on this painting. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's all. Does anybody want to say something about these paintings? It is a much more hopeful, hopeful painting. It has a lot more sky. It has, oops, sorry. It has a lot more sky. And there is, a, Nazis are leaving uh, under the smoke. He, last year, okay, so I want to move on to the next uh, segment. Last year, I attended um, a, an inter a conference. I, I read a paper on my grandfather's Bobby Yar, but I attended, and this was the first international conference um, set uh, centered in Budapest. Um, the first international conference on the art of Holocaust. So there is a lot of research of Holocaust. If you go to American studies conferences, there is always the biggest panels there drawing a lot of people, but there is hardly any, any research of the art. So I think that we are at the beginning of this next chapter where people are really beginning to look at the paintings. Um, and so, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I wanted to ask you. So, um, so, so there are, you know, looking, looking at the different art, I found the recurrent, recurrent themes, the recurrent themes that artists from 
different parts of the world, in Argentina, in Europe, and in, in America, created these paintings, but they would be similar themes and symbols. And I would find those themes in my grandfather's later work. So can you throw out some, can you, can you throw some images, symbols that you find in, in, that symbolize the Holocaust in visual form? Smokestacks. That's right. So protection, protection, ca caring. <laughs> yeah. Fact Brilliant. Of the really. Of the pictures, of the books, of the story shows the tremendous lack of the lack of evolution, so to speak, of the human consciousness. And what can we do to improve? that consciousness so that nothing of this sort will happen again. What can we do so that it, nothing happens again? I don't know, are you, anyone is hopeful? <laughs> yes. Faceless people, it's, it's a very common theme. That's very interesting. Starvation, Starvation hunger, famine, yes. So it mentions, but I think it's really significant, the opening of the clouds. The opening. A break in heavy to let the blue to let the hope is essential because if you don't have hope what is there to live for right yeah and maybe this is where those people are looking at us right yeah yes okay um so these are just some of the themes that um you know, I find in different we, researchers find in different works the cues of people, the vacant, uh, the vacant faces, but also vacant landscapes, deep uh, smokestacks, cargo train, the train that you have, the the car that transport that you have downstairs, the shovel in Limbersky. We talked about the blue and the yellow, um, the crucifixion, right? Why do the Jews show crucifixion, the cross? And resistance and a protest and many artists take on the role of speaking for those who don't have a voice is social justice right protecting it happened to us but this idea of protecting others uh, so we don't have a lot of well, I guess we have some time but I will just I want to show you some of this work so speak for the oppressed uh, Limbersky turned his 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 eye his brush his art towards the people who were involved in the, towards industrial workers. So the Soviets always wanted to show the workers as strong, as powerful, right? The, the, the proletariat, the, the, the ruler of the world. These are the workers that Limbersky saw during the war, right? The children, the children who took on the, took on, took the places of their parents uh, who went to the uh, front lines the wounded. Um, this young woman overproduced her required, uh, required uh, norm by um, how many she over, she produced, oops, oops sorry, uh, she produced over 3000 shells. And I want to know, was she trying to impress, impress the uh, industrial authorities or was she doing this work because she had a brother or a father or a loved one at the front lines and she was doing this work for her. In industrial um, plants in the home front, people died. He, they also died from overexhaustion, from overwork. There were very strict rules during the war um, where even being late um, to work would send a person to the labor, forced labor camp. Stakhanovitz, Stakhanovitz, right. She was a Stakhanov water, worker, yes, yes. Um, so yeah, yeah, so there was this, these were the great people who s served the work effort, but they also died in industrial accidents. In the aftermath of the war, Limbersky turns his attention to the regular people, right? He has no interest in painting uh, political leaders or famous uh, celebrities. He paints his neighbors, 
uh, the people in the neighborhood, the elderly, the workers, the, um, the unnamed people, um, and gives them the place in history through his art. Nineteen fifty eight was a hopeful time in Russia. Um, Stalin died in fifty three in um, Khrushchev when he came to power, admitted that mistakes were made. Political prisoners began to return from the labor from Gulag, and those who didn't return were um, acquitted pos posthumously. Limbersky goes back to the Urals where he was before the war and during the war for a short period of time. Is there a style change here? I mean, I mean, here, go back to that other one, the one before this one, and you see how, how simple. Yes, how simple yes. How it is. It's not, a, it's not as detailed as, uh, and in cases of expressionism, he, he was more impressionistic. This is more rudimentary. Yes, yes, it's more simple. Stunning, stunning change. And he writes to his wife from, in a letter from this, from this town that I, have, I work constantly around the clock and I have never felt the way I do now. So uh, I, you make me regret, your comment makes me regret because I had, a, I had a slide where I showed this painting next to his, the same spot, the same location from the 1930s, and it is a stunning difference. One is brown and more realistic and, and uh, detailed and textured pastos, and this is just flattened, right? This is, this is coming back to the avant-garde, right? The avant-garde, yeah. modernism. I'm sorry. Yes. That, that he had, he could not uh, paint the perspective? Maybe, I think that he personally was drawn to people. His, all of, half of his, uh, all of his earlier art was about people. And even if, when he did the composition, it was just teeming, teeming with, with faces. And it is a stunning contrast to his later work that became completely depopulated. He, he, he says it in your letter, he, he said- I never uh, felt. That he was working very fast. Around the clock. And enjoying it. I would think that this is more of a quicker way to capture all that he was seeing that was good. That's right. To do the past. So it, it looks a little simple, but he's capturing so much more. All this complex. That's right. It takes 30 years to learn to make a painting like this in 15 minutes, right? Right. right. No, no, as an artist, I know this. Yeah. It is a it is a happier. I think it is the ha happiest moment in his life. Yes. So I remember the factory worker Tatiana. I think her name. Is, yes. Uh, uh, and why would she exceed the demands of the system? Yeah. And all of that. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, what my answer would be uh, to confirm her own identity and hope. Yes. Uh, yes. For, for something else. Yeah. And that's way to connect to that and also I see that <clears throat> in this painting mm -hmm. I see hope yes and I see that connection to his identity yeah yeah it's very interesting that I think that his post-war paintings are more hopeful more hopeful than the works that were done before he experienced this catastrophe um, and yes I think that people worked to have meaning right like I feel the same way now. Like, what can I do, right? What can I do in this moment? What can I do today to help? Uh, the smokestacks. Um, these are industrial landscapes, right? But there is always a smoke. There is this gap gapping doorway, and there is the berm of earth, right? 
there is a worm of earth. And those of us who had experienced trauma, you know that it never goes away. It was always with us. Even when we are removed from the places where something happened, it's always there. And everything that you see is somehow this other thing is always present. And I think this is how it was for us. We have them in Boston. We have them here. Um, so take a look at uh, take a look at this smokestack. At this, uh, what does this look like? It's a fist, right? Do you want to go back? Right, it's a fist. It's a fist. Right. And this, these figures, I know some people will see it. I don't need to explain, but I think I see, I see the band figures from, right? A family, right? It's a suggestion. Hmm? It's a suggestion of the artist of probably humanity entering a little bit into the light. Yes. Yes. And I think that for him it was important not just to talk about the Holocaust. It was these paintings are collective, collective images for, for the 20th century, for, for I think our human experience, right? The cargo train. So we have a, you, you have a transport here at the museum, right? But in Russia, the cargo train was also how the soldiers went to the front lines, right? How the prisoners went to Gulag. Uh, Limbersky took this train when after after he was wounded in the siege of Leningrad and um, contracted dystrophy after he was taking uh, food across the road of life uh, life into the city. He was evacuated. He went um, in that train, and here it is from the inside. Wait, wait. Oh, are you sorry, sorry, sorry? Yes. <laughs> You're more of tentative audience. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> I, don't. I see more detail in this than some of the ones we've just been looking at. This one shows a little bit more detail, especially when you look at the fact that he took such great care in putting the lines in there so it was required. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's hard. Do you know what the lines mean? What are they for? Well, Does So this grid, this is actually a technical, technical art, artistic device. So before, before we had Xerox, right, or before we had the projections, this is how the artist. So this is a sketch for another painting, and when he has this uh, study, he puts the graphs and then square by square. It's a grid. It's a grid that then square by square, square he transfers it in the, under the canvas. But I think that I think to me, I see it the same way that the grid is almost an added accidental element of of this imprisonment part of the picture i mean it fully makes that same statement that it's yeah painting. and this is how the readers the viewers complete the painting through your own eyes it's also a much heavier painting because of the color it's, it's troublesome it's dark again right even the pink doesn't it almost makes it Not literal as the way I do right now. He's probably turning in his grave <laughs> that we're trying. <laughs> but no, but he does have his philosophical statements. A lot of his statements had to do against he would he was very courageous and very public about the repressions, the censorship in the Soviet art. He demanded diversity of artistic expression. He would draw applause because he would vocalize, he would say things that other people thought in their hearts, but who thought uh, in themselves, but were too careful not to speak up. But someone has to, right? Somebody has to speak up. Um, but he was also very loved and protected by his community. At the train station, um, here is our train, right? And here are two women, and there is a shadow and a shawl, and a shawl. It's always there, but I think what's interesting, what I want to point out, what I want to draw your attention to, 
here is the white woman right here and the black woman right and the composition of the painting is very horizontal and this was done in the early 60s right the beginning of the civil rights movement in the u.s and there were photographs that published in 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 the russian newspapers and i think that he is drawing parallel between this uh fight of the blacks to um to to have freedoms to dis for desegregation for equal rights and he draws parallel with the condition of the artists, of the Jews, of the repressed uh, people in the Soviet Union. Yes. Yeah. So that is the <laughs> that is the subject of uh, the memoir. I'll. I'll talk about this. I'll, I'll come back to this question. So I'm, I'm actually grateful because I wasn't going to talk about the memoir, but, but I will now. Um, so here is another a person who is interesting. His hands are white, his arms are white, but his face is black. So there is this condition. Um, we talked about the shovels. They come back as incest, insistent, insistent recurrent image in the dozens and dozens of his works. Um, it is a photograph of a painting that went in some direction in the 60s. Sure, but I mean, was the original in black and white? No, just it's a, just a photo. I, that's all we have. I believe it was in color. These were the studies. These were part of that big, big series, right? The shovel, the shovel, the black shadow, this black shadow with a little uh, splash of yellow, right? What does it mean? I, I, I don't want to run out of time, so I, I just want to um, raise. But I want to ask you to look very carefully at um, this painting. Where do you see the face? Are you looking at... Uh, Oh, you're looking at this yeah. right here. Yes, yeah, yes, that's the figure. A character or a, it almost looks like a ram or something. The, oh, you're looking at the back. <laughs> at the bottom, in the, on the, which side? Are you talking on the right or on the left? On, on the left, right here. Where? Uh, you see right here? Right there. That's, you see the face or what do you see? The shovel or the face? The shovel, yeah. You know, it's interesting um, that people mention, uh, people mention the animal, perhaps the horse, and I wonder, so during, during the siege, he was, he was in the siege of Leningrad, and uh, when the ice was frozen over the Lake Ladega, the road of life was established, he was taking, he was taking uh, food into the city by horse, right, under the enemy fire. It was very dangerous. And I know that one of the horses was, was wounded, was, was killed. And I, I don't know if this was something that he had in mind. Please take a look at, at this area. It's, it's a dog, it's a fire, it's a fire. The eyes and the mouse, yeah with the point he had. It's of humans. Who? Is it? Is, it? is, is this a face? That's my overlay, but I don't know. That was my overlay. I, I traced it in with the tracing paper. So, so I agree with you, but it's very hard to see. But people who study Holocaust and who saw they excavated, this is how these people, what they excavated looked like. Yeah, should we move on, is it sad? Yes. At the very top, right there? Right there, above there. Oh, right there. Yeah. 
So it's almost like a Kabbalistic eye. So perhaps it is a human, it's a figure. To the right, right? You know, I see eyes sometimes inserted in his abstract work, so it could be. I think sometimes he puts in something for himself that may be meant to just just be there as a presence. The road. So people with a closed mouth and unable to speak. Uh, people on the move. The yellow leaves. Right. Is that sixties to you? Yeah. I I would love to do an exhibition of American sixties when he's sixties, especially Jewish artists. So I want to take a little break here. Uh, do we have time to take a little break here and to to talk about something really more hopeful, which is nineteen twenties uh, avant garde. So the peaceful time, we think of this period often as a very dark and destruction, but in fact that in 1920s Ukraine was this tremendous blossoming of art. And uh, there were two major institutions. So this was, this was the time when the Jews, Ukrainians, and the Russians worked together to create this new, radically different uh, revolutionary art that they turned away from the Western classical art and they started to reinvent what it is, this art of the new generation. All of them were young, right? Two institutions formed, the Kulturliga and uh, Kiev Art Institute. The Kulturliga was the Jewish uh, school. They had publishing house and the Kiev Art Institute was the Ukrainian place that was found looking for the Ukrainian, new Ukrainian national art. Uh, so the, I just want to show the teachers. These were, this is my grandfather's teacher Mark Epstein. And you probably can read some of these letters better than I can. It was Yiddish. They looked at the Yiddish Hebrew letters as both a layer of meaning and a graphic element. Um, they looked at the children drawings, at the folk art, at the stone and wood carvings uh, as an inspiration. Uh, some of you may know El Lisitsky, you know him better by, uh, by photo montage and his posters, later posters, but in fact he was one of the founding mem members of Jewish uh, Kulturliga. Uh, here is a very little known artist who was also one of the founding members of Kulturliga. Uh, and um, uh, they, they, they had their publishing house and they published children books, they published magazines, they published uh, Yiddish writers. Um, here, is the, uh, here is the fans, uh, the Tchaikov's illustration to The Boastful Rooster, Mark Perish's uh, book of the nursery rhymes, and um, on the right there is Mark Chagall's cover, um, right? The Vacant Place Faces and the two heads of the same person looking in different, right, looking forward and looking back. Troyer, Soro. So, and this is the studio of Kulturliga at the time when my grandfather was a student there. So maybe he is somewhere to the outside the margin. Mm -hmm. And I want to also show Mark uh, Viktor Palmov, a Russian artist who worked and closely with the Jewish artists. He was completely forgotten, com completely hidden uh, in Ukraine until very, very recently. Um, and I find a lot of his influence in my grandfather's later work. So he is currently one of my favorite artists. So does, what does fence mean in the uh, Jewish uh, text, in the Jewish culture, literature? Separation? Separation? What is? The ghetto, the shtetl, the, 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 the com confinement. It was a very, very, uh, it was a recurrent theme and the title of several works in the Yiddish uh, 20th century authors, right? Um, any? The open door. 
the shtetl is opening up, right? The pale of settlement is opening up. Anybody reads Perkeya Wood? Make the fence around Torah, right? So it's contain confinement and also containment. And safety, protection, right? So here is Chikov's uh, 1922 illustration and Limberski's um, painting, what, uh, 40 years later, right? And I think it's not accidental he knew this work. So I think he wants to bring back the memory of those artists. It's almost he is asking, okay, how would this work look in color? What would it be like if this art would be allowed uh, to continue? Right, and some of you will see little people. I think you would probably see little people in little or not. Right there, little faces in keeper. Right? And here is little feet. But there is. I don't know. <laughs> it's a stretch for you. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> okay. So where is the crucifixion here? In the fence. Is that a stretch? It's not a stretch. <laughs> and there is a fence. Yes, yes, yes. And the person is on the other side of the fence, right? And the person is almost walking on water, right? The fence is a recurrent, recurrent uh, symbol in his many, many of his works. I can't show all of them, but so why does the Jew uh, show the, the crucifixion? Because Jesus was a Jew. Because Jesus was a Jew. Can I ask you about confinement? Yes. Right. I assume I've never heard your grandfather for a moment to escape confinement and to go, let's say, to Israel. I don't think this was a choice, and I'm sure, I'm sure that it occurred to him. He, I'm sure. If he physically could have, what do you think he would have done? He would have left. You think so? Yes, I think so. And I know so because he was very close friend with um, another artist in his later years, and uh, Mikhail Reichel, who had emigrated the year it was, um, it was became possible. And uh, they came, I think, right before or right after the Yom Kippur War. So there was nothing would stop them. And I think that that was also how my grandfather felt. So Mark Chagall's White Crucifixion before the Holocaust and uh, Limberski's Yellow crucifixion in 64. I attempt to why uncover hidden spirituality in nature and express object as a metaphor. Um, <laughs> so the name seamstress in the Russian language is Shviya. And I think that it is very similar phonetically to Shiva, right? Um, Right, and is that a woman or a man? And is that a keeper? And do you see a shin where the tefillin is put on for the daily prayer? That's my interpretation. But there is a picture in the back. And what does the picture mean in the visual or in the Jewish world? Teacher, water, mayim, mayim. It's a levy, right? It's a sign of a levy you find on the Jewish tombstones, right? The washing of the, the washing the hands of the kohen, kohen. But yes, yes, yes. Where? Right there, right? The post, yeah, and the doorway, and the window. 
it's there are many 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 symbols in there i mean each painting we should look at for uh, limberskin something looks like swastika that somebody says right there swastikas yeah i don't know i don't know or hebrew letters i see i see it as a, it's a hint yeah he has crosses in the windows and um he said in the in his in the 60s in his speeches he said an artist has to create the kind of work that a, a viewer will look and go home and think about it and come back and say i have not seen anything and another um, point he made is that the painting is made of uh, several layers two layers one is what you see right away is the immediate image and the rest is what is hidden um, underneath and the last painting i want to show is the rikpu okay is the reclining so this this is not a reclining this is 1930s uh, detail of his thesis painting a woman came to identify a worker who died in the um, industrial accident and this is oh, where where is it going oh where sorry okay then okay here she is in the blue She looks. Twenty years later, Limberski paints another woman in blue, grieving. Thank you. appreciate the interaction and the dialogue and the presentation. So I do invite you to take another look at some paintings, um, especially one you saw um, zoomed in. What you're not seeing is the texture of the work, which is just quite, just quite exquisite. And uh, um, we, uh, we're not going to give them back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They are better off here because people can see them than in my closet. <laughs> I, I did have a question. How, yes. how many pieces in its entirety are, are being exhibited? So today we have two pieces. I have we have several hundred in our home collection, about a hundred oils, several hundred works on paper that are as large as the paintings, you know, in charcoals that some of them I showed, and some small sketches that give the clues, the keys to the works. They are, these are the only works that are exhibited um, right now. But my mother's hope was to, to, we did not sell these works over the last 30 years because my mother's hope was that they will eventually end up in museums and uh, either in many different museums or in a museum of his own. So we're, we'll see what. The Russians didn't take them out? Yes. My mother brought them out legally at very high cost to her, to her own, uh, not, not the monetary cost, but the, uh, she was imprisoned uh, when I was 11 years old. I was left without a family. Uh, we were homeless after she came back. Um, so we were refuseniks for nine years. Uh, my grandmother lived in the United States on her own, uh, alone. She had to learn the language and adapt to this country by herself. Um, but here we are. <laughs> In the museum. In the Thank museum. you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for your wonderful uh, questions and for the dialogue. Uh, I hope to see you back soon for the Rappaport Lecture. Uh, which this year actually is a film screening called The Conspiracy on October 25th. Thanks. <laughs>